thank you, Peter, and thank you to all of you for taking time. It's always awesome to come and visit with you at this meeting. I'm not a big fan of this meeting in general. It's chaos, but being with you is always fantastic. Um, so, uh, three issues, strategy, replenishment, and transition, which are all kind of related, actually. So the strategy, so we're really excited about the strategy, and thanks to uh, all of you who have participated through the constituencies to put your uh, words in. The, uh, I'll just emphasize two of the pieces that are new-ish, or at least emphasize more, because I think they're hugely important. One is human rights uh, as a full standalone uh, pillar of the strategy. So it was there before, but it was there as part of impact. And we, that fundamentally is our entry point into human rights is the impact because of HIV and tuberculosis and the, the uniqueness of those diseases and the vulnerable groups. But to have it as a standalone pillar is hugely important. And for those of you who are around during the last strategy debate, just getting human rights in was actually a battle. This time there was no question it was going to be in. The question was how aggressively it was going to be in, and it wound up being very aggressively in. And, you know, all the debates that occurred in New York um, didn't occur in our board, because uh, we had ministries of health and we had all of you there. So, really, thank you for getting it there. And that relates to civil society, which is the second pillar, which is resilient and sustainable that one is not doing health, it. which is also a standalone pillar this time, not just a subsidiary. And the reason I mention that is because we're very intentional about the words. And I was even talking with Margaret Chan, and she wants to change to systems for health. Because the point is, health systems can classically end in a clinic. You don't have to go into the community, you're just in the clinic. And that's where a health system ends. And we know that if that's where health systems end, we know that if that's where health systems end, we'll fail. We'll fail the people who are most vulnerable and we'll fail in ending the epidemic. That you have to have the community component and it has to be a smooth, very smooth connection from the clinic piece to the community piece. Otherwise, we won't reach the most marginal and vulnerable, which means we can't achieve the human rights objective. We won't find them, we won't make them welcome, we won't get them into services, keep them into services, and keep them healthy. Not just treatment, but actually prevention. And those two components of the strategy are hugely important to us. And as you know, we've rebuilt the community rights and gender group from where it was three years ago to a powerhouse, and Kate and Rolf and the team are here. Um, and it's. We think we have great opportunities to deliver on the strategy. Now, the strategy committee is debating the allocation, as you know, but within the uh, catalytic funding, we are very intent, if, they, if we get agreement from the board, on very strong community system strengthening pieces. Yeah. Oh, it's because some of you don't know the ridiculous nature of our systems and how they work, so it's not intuitive. So the way we work is we raise the money, which we hope is 13 billion, I'll come back to that. Um, and then it gets allocated to countries, but the board decided that um, above the allocation, or in addition to the allocation, we would have two buckets of $800 million. One bucket of $800 million is to help ensure, and this relates to transition, that countries don't have deep drop-offs uh, based on the formula, which is driven by disease burden and gross national income, basically. So it gives a protective cushion that the Secretariat can recommend to the board is used to protect from deep, steep drop-offs. The second 800 million is the piece I'm very excited about, which is called catalytic funding, which is to be used to ensure that pieces of the strategy we struggle with within allocations are catalyzed. And they fundamentally relate to human rights uh, systems, including community systems and building the capacity not only for civil society to engage from an implementation standpoint, but from an advocacy standpoint. And that means multi-country efforts, it means building on what we've done with Robert Carr and what Kate's team has done. It means ensuring that even when countries transition, we can engage in a multi-country way to support civil society, which we have the freedom to do with multi-country grants. Um, 
So we're very excited about that. We very much look forward to working with the civil society constituencies and with all of you fed in through that process. Because uh, we think the catalytic fund around human rights and around community system strengthening and community engagement is, is key. It's also important that we see the catalytic pool as not standalone, so our goal is to actually use it as a driver of use of allocation, because 800 million is a lot, but it's not enough to do everything we want to do. So whether it's two to one, three to one, five to one, depends on the topic area, we want countries to use the catalytic pool to then drive their own allocations and even their national budgets. Now we have to be careful with that around human rights and civil society because some countries might say, fine, I won't put any money in the allocation into it. So we have to be a little bit careful and we'll protect against that. But we're very excited about the opportunities there. The strategy committee will be weighing these issues. But I think we can learn from what we did this time um, and really do something extraordinary the next time. So to do that, we need the money. Um, 13 billion is a lot. Um, a month ago, I would have been hyper confident we were going to get there. Um, it wasn't just the Brexit vote, it was the government's changing in October, which was fine because we were going to be fine. Then the government was changing September 2nd, then it was changing September 9th, and now it's changed. We have a new minister, we have a different set of, we have a new Secretary of State, we have a different set of ministers. Going from where we were and the confidence we had with the last government to rebuilding all of that between now and September 16th is a tough road. Um, we are going to be hyper-engaged. We're working closely with civil society, which is very strong in the UK. Um, but basically right now, getting to 13 depends on the UK and Germany. But everyone else, I mean, we've done so well, and thank you to all of you who have participated and really pushed that. Uh, all the other big donors are in and in at the target level we were trying to get with them. You know, we have Prime Minister Trudeau leading the charge, and, and I mean leading the charge. I mean, this is the first time we've had a head of government, head of state disengaged. We've never had a launch event for the replenishment with the head of state, head of government. It's always been delegated down. We've never even had a launch event. It's just been a press release or an announcement and a speech. You know, he called together 300 young people to call for not just replenishing the fund, but it's really around the, the civil society pieces, the community engagement pieces, and the human rights pieces that they're excited about. And to see the global fund as part of a narrative, not just a narrative, but concretely delivering on a vision of when we look outward, when we look forward, we solve big problems, as we've done over the last 15 years. When we look inward and backward, we mess things up really badly and a focus on human rights, a focus on community engagement, a focus on youth engagement. That's actually the narrative around the replenishment. And the Prime Minister is really driving that, personally driving that, with the full government behind him and civil society engaging. Uh, but it really is going to come down now to where the UK gets to and where Germany gets to. At the same time, we need the Nordic countries to thank you to our friends who are working on this hard. Um, uh, I, you know, the Netherlands and Norway are looking pretty solid relative to their last commitments. We're hearing better things out of Denmark and Sweden, um, but we the, really the push between now and you know the 16th is going to be huge. It's not clear to us when the decisions will be made. The reality is, as you all know, people are still looking at what is the influx of refugee migrants look like and therefore how will budgets be distributed. Um, and they really don't know yet. Um, so that keeping the pressure on, keeping the engagement, letting people know that there is engagement in civil society response is hugely important. I am still confident we will get to the 13th, um, but we're gonna have to do a lot of work, a lot more work than we would have had to a month ago, literally. Actually, two weeks ago. Uh, it's changed that quickly. Um, on the transition that kind of relates to both, I mean, how much money we have will determine you know, how big our cushion funds are um, uh, and how big the allocations are. Um, you know, I do want to put aside a couple of myths that are out there. There are maybe three countries that will get to high income over the next six to nine years. I mean, it's really moving from low to middle to upper middle. 
and then it's disease burden related. And I, I want to remind people, I really don't know where this is coming from, but there are protections within the transition formula. So any country that has a, a key population with a prevalence rate of 5% is protected. So it's not just GNI and it's not just overall disease burden, there's a protection built in for key population disease burden. And then we have flexibilities both within the catalytic pool and within the uh, 800 million protective pool on transition that we'll be using aggressively to help protect. But the reality is countries have to step up more and that's where your engagement is also important. We need more focusing on civil society and key population. We think there's huge opportunity to grow in this and we really want to work with you in designing that. The next three years, we'll be fine. You know, there'll be some countries, and I know there'll be some countries you're not happy about their numbers. I accept that that's part of the problem of not having all the money that we need. Um, but we're all gonna have to work together over this next three years to set a foundation so that the next three years is gonna go well. Because this is gonna get harder and harder, and that's the message I just want to make sure you understand. This three years, we'll do okay. The next three years and the next three years will be extraordinarily difficult. And if we don't have a strong foundation built over these next three years for transition, for human rights, for civil society, we're gonna be in deep, deep trouble. So we're going to have disagreements. We welcome disagreements. We welcome your push. It's good. Uh, it, it helps us think. It helps us do better. Um, but let's really focus on how we can solve some of these problems. And again, if we work together, we'll solve our biggest problems. So thank you. And thank you all for everything. You're really, you're awesome. We love you and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thanks, Mark. So, the, the idea is right that we have as much dialogue as possible. So I suggest we focus the first quarter, we have half an hour, on the implementation issues, the allocations, the funding, the strategy, all the questions you have in relation to what the business of the global, global funds is actually about, right? Um, working with the countries. And then the second 50 minutes maybe, uh, resource mobilization. There are many people here looking around that work every day on open fund resource mobilization. What's plan B? Right? And, and all your thoughts. Sorry, I had uh, to roll my <laughs> Any questions? First, let's take implementation. Funding model. We, we use the same. Well, I have a robot mic here, so I'm going to walk around. I'm going to start Daniel. Standing here. Daniel. We'll take a couple. Is that okay? Okay, good afternoon everyone. My name is Daniel. I work for AIDS Accountability International. And my major concern is around uh, supporting civil society, especially in Africa, around the watch the role that they're playing. And um, I'm very grateful to the Glo Global Fund for the work that they are doing and for the leadership that Fund is providing. So, but one of the major concerns I have at the moment is that um, we see across Africa, because AI is trying to set up national accountability forums that will monitor um, expenditure use of investment, especially around health. And we see that um, there are a few civil society organizations that are doing that at the moment. And we are trying to come up with a funding model. I'm not speaking to the global fund model, but I'm saying everyone who is investing in Africa should start getting worried to say who is monitoring. Because there's been a lot of issues around uh, accountability in terms of the implementation process. And I think the global fund, I'm appealing to you, Mark, to say, can you support us in this way, the way we're trying to revive advocates in terms of what to draw of civil society? Because it also works to advantage if we're able to account for the resources tomorrow. Thanks, Dan. Anybody else in that corner? Uh, Is, uh, Can you identify yourself, please? Who you are? My name is Happy Hassan from Tanzania. And uh, my concern is uh, not very far away from Daniel. It's like many times we get uh, the, the CSOs or we, the networks, we get to, to be involved. But in the end, in the implementation, uh, like when it comes to the sub sub recipient, we, we don't stand anymore. At the big, on the process, you get to be told that you're going to be there. But in the end, 
you just end up as implementing partner, something that uh, will never capacitate, capacitate us, you know, and uh, the technical support, because because if you're just an outreach work, you're going to implement on outreach work, then there's no way you're going to capaci be capacitated, right? Yeah. For that, uh, I don't know how you're going to yeah. help. Very us. clear point, and a, and a well-known point, I think, Mark, so... Please go ahead and then we go for uh, questions uh, first. Uh, thanks for coming here and thanks uh, for all the good work uh, Global Fund is doing. Uh, I have a concern about uh, the accountability. I, I, I'm based in India and I'm also based in the uh, United States. But, uh, we're focusing on India and talking about we, we don't have good uh, coordination with the country coordinating system, I mean, CCMs. And the uh, elections of CCMs are totally opaque. We, we don't know who our CCMs are. And uh, I've been, I'm, I'm one of the uh, developing country in your delegation, 2005 six, uh, on the board. Uh, so this is one of the concerns. You know, we need a good coordination with the CCMs and then this, we need the stronger CCMs to be presented so that we have good accountability in the global fund. That's, that's more Thank like you. a statement, which is fine, and then you could maybe reflect on the three questions so far. So, um, Daniel, on the accountability piece, you know, we are funding some observatories, which I think are hugely important to bring civil society in this. Uh, not just um, how much money is being spent, but what's it being spent on, and really holding people to account for that. We have a role in that, but I think this also relates to transition. We need to bring another actor. So there are, um, and Ralph worked for one of them, there are foundations that, ex that have deep interest in accountability and governance issues. Um, Soros Foundation certainly does OSI. So does uh, uh, Mo Ibrahim. So does the Gates Foundation. So do some other foundations. And then there are high net worth individuals who are interested. And I actually think we need to broaden our scope and look more than the traditional funders, the traditional multilateral funders, not only for things like funding of uh, accountability structures, uh, which actually Bill Gates talked about yesterday in Nigeria and the great work that's done by an advocate there in his Nelson Mandela lecture, uh, that there is an appetite for this. We just need to be smarter and more coordinated. It's a little bit uh, like transition. So I think it's perfectly appropriate to put pressure on us, but a point I've been making is we have donors that don't have national funding for needle exchange programs. We have donors who have not particularly strong records on LGBTI and gender issues. It's not as if development money goes to fund programs there. There are others who do it. So we need to start now building the networks of fine financial support that's more than development. Because development money is intended for poorer countries. That's, that's the people who give development money, that's how they think. But there are other people who think in different ways. And we need to start pulling them together uh, over this next three years in order to build that foundation for the future. And I think this is one where there are groups that exist to fund watchdog governance accountability structures, which relates a little bit to your question, which I agree. You know, the CCMs are known. It's on websites, but it's not easily accessible. And it relates, I think, in general, just like public sector folks where you have fights in between different organizations and people want one. We have the same thing in civil society, and that's the, that's the honest, that's the reality, right? So to some extent, we have to turn to you all to have the leadership to direct that and to pull people together and to try to resolve these issues because we're never going to be able to resolve those issues for you. Only civil society among yourself are going to be able to resolve those issues. And if those issues don't get resolved, it will always be problematic. And I think there is an issue. Um, we're really trying with our civil society strengthening, which comes to the second question, to get not from international organizations, but to get international financing for regional, local, and then local, local. Because I have actually seen, not infrequently in countries, where the CCM civil society members have no idea who the civil society groups outside of the capital are. They have no idea who they are. 
And if civil society doesn't come together in the country to do that, which we really want to help finance with the civil society strengthening other pieces, there's nothing we're going to do to hold civil society accountable to each other. There's nothing we're going to do in Geneva. So I hope you all are able to really work on this piece, because if we don't, it's going to unravel and it's going to turn into fighting. Um, CCMs are great mechanisms because they engage civil society, but I think in the new funding model, and now what we're trying to do is say CCMs are great, but they're not always the vehicle to bring civil society in. There are other vehicles, and I think our teams are working really hard at that. Uh, but really it's going to come down to civil society also holding themselves accountable and driving yourselves to achieve what's necessary to get us to the next step. Thank you. One more question on implementation. The two gentlemen here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, my name is Oscar from Zimbabwe. Uh, I think, do we now have a, a watertight definition of community system strengthening? I think that's where the challenge is. You go, government will say, if you are paying uh, health workers, I mean the village health workers or community volunteers, health system strengthening, and therefore normally the definition of community system strengthening, it creates a lot of challenges. That's where I think, and then the other issue is, when do we expect uh, the country allocations. We now have uh, some indication terms of when we can then expect some country allocations. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Silver Mpopo. I'm from Zimbabwe. Uh, I think my question is almost like similar to the one that Oscar has posed. Uh, when, when you talk of uh, community system strengthening, normally we, we have challenges where the, the communities are able to like come up with concrete indicators of uh, the, the, the initiatives that they are coming up with. How best can we really try and assist civil society, particularly communities, to, to be able to, to come up with the uh, uh, initiatives that uh, 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 can, can, can be uh, 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 accounted for in terms of indicators? from Pumalanga province in the Department of Health. Uh, I just want to check, uh, I've seen the list of the, the programs that we are funding there. Uh, community strengthening is part of those, of which it's a kind of 100% coverage. But I've seen there is a gap on the key population. Uh, I don't know what informed uh, the Global Fund not to pay more attention to that, because I think it's one of the key programs if we are targeting the 1990 strategies, but I've seen on the, on the program that we are funding, including the provinces, uh, there is a gap on the key population. I think it is a gap that we need to address, if I can be assisted on that. And also, what, just to check with you, do you consider South Africa as uh, the making income country, or what do you put it according to the explanation that you've just made? Thank you. Uh, my name is Zelda, I'm from Swaziland. Uh, I would like to appreciate the work that's being done by the Global Fund, especially in um, scaling up uh, the work done by civil society and also raising the voice of uh, civil society nationally. However, I still feel uh, the authority uh, or the impact of, of civil society is still weakened by the value that Global Fund places on government in terms of uh, authority of the funds that come into the country. You know, even if you can, be, if you are a civil, civil society member, be in CCM, have a position of authority, you still like a, a block that cannot buy because you don't have that decision making power as as much as government does. So I don't know if there's a way by which uh, the system can strengthen the role that is played by civil society in terms of having some decision making power. Okay, so excellent questions. Um, and a lot of them related. Um, God, I can't read my writing. Oh, so Oscar, definition of civil society is I don't think there's a, 
a solid definition. There almost shouldn't be because it's different in countries depending on the, where civil society is at and what their strengths are. But I think it relates to Zelda's question. And actually, we have some great examples and we need to learn from each other. So oftentimes the government is very interested in working with civil society, but they don't know how. They actually don't have funding mechanisms. They don't know how to set up those tools. They don't know how to talk with civil society. So what we've done working with UNAIDS and others in, say, in Central America, which I think is a great example, is actually what we funded was building the relationships between government and civil society, particularly the LGBTI community, which is so impacted on HIV and the government. And, and then also working with them to structure financing relationships so that over time there's sustainability group and supporting civil society. Uh, and I think those, that's a unique thing that the Global Fund can engage in, and we'll be looking to do that. And um, I might ask, because this is the last um, implementation series of questions, I might ask Kate or Ralph to see if they want to wrap up with anything at the end. But I do think this is something we should be working on. We don't want to get too strict in the definition, because we, relative to the, we do want innovation. So we want the innovation on what does civil society need to do. And that's a point we make all the time when talking about innovation. People jump to technology. Technology is really important, but some of the best innovations over the last 15 years have actually been the community-based innovations for how to deliver services in the most effective way. There's been great examples in South Africa with TB Reach and with other programs that actually are doubling and tripling effectiveness. Adherence is all driven by civil society and, and the innovation that you've come up with. So capturing those innovations and supporting them is hugely important. And when governments see the impact, you know, the best people in government want to fund those things because they know they can't reach that impact. I mean, most governments actually understand that they can't get where they need to go by themselves. Uh, they just don't know how to work with them. So I think that's a key role and something we should be working on. Again, it's not Global Fund unique. There are others out there we should be bringing in to allow that to be happening. Um, uh, South Africa is an upper middle income country. It's not our determination. Uh, it's the World Bank's determination. But because of your disease burden, it basically doesn't matter. So you're in a category of high income, but uh, what do we call it? Extreme disease or extreme disease. So you know, South Africa is in a very different category, which is why despite your income status, you have pretty massive grants, one of which we just signed the other day. On financing for key populations in South Africa, actually it's true everywhere. It's kind of a mix of PEPFAR's got a lot of money here too, and they actually spend a lot on key populations. We have a particular emphasis on sex workers um, because that's the piece that the government, that was actually a huge gap. We have a particular piece on prisoners, especially related to TB and HIV. We do have programs related to LGBTI here, but PEPFAR also has pretty large programs and the government's pretty committed too. We have a gap, not only for key populations, we have a gap. Uh, we have a gap in the world for treatment. Um, and key populations are at risk of being disproportionately affected unless communities are more involved. And that's why we're really pushing what we're doing. That's why we've empowered the community rights and gender group. But it's not just them. I mean, everyone looks to Kate's team as they should because they're extraordinary. But what we're trying to do is embed all of that in the country team so that the country teams understand that every time they have a conversation, they need to talk about communities. They need to talk about key populations. And our technical review panel has been great at driving that message too and sending grants back to say you're missing too big of a part of your population if we're really trying to get towards solving the epidemic. Um, uh, I think I got all of them. Swaziland linked to what I talked about before about um, uh, engage, really trying to support government engagement um, and, and really understanding that link. And we've seen great great success. Uh, we've seen tremendous movement in countries and we just need to build on that. Kate and Ralph, do you want to come? Oh, country allocation, sorry. So the fall board meeting, which is November 15, 16, 17, something like that, um, the allocations and the general parameters around the uh, catalytic fund will be determined and also how that $800 million in supplemental funding to protect countries from too rapid declines that will be formally, that will all be done at the November board meeting. Committee meetings are in October. Thanks. So I think we have five more minutes, and I think we should maybe look into research conversation. Um, so you like to say that oh, maybe uh, Ralph and I could stay behind and answer any questions? Ralph, could you stay behind a little bit? 
Okay, so Kate Thompson, Ralph Jurgens, Community Rights and Gender Team of the Global Fund, um, are staying on for those who have questions more linked you know, to the details of some of the issues you've been addressing. Maybe research mobilization, just a little bit, Plan B, because we heard it's we might not get the 13 billion, we hope we get the 13 billion. There are still questions out there, Germany, uh, UK, the Nordic countries, adding all that up, it makes it yes, we get to the 30 billion or not. What's plan B? Um, does the Global Fund have a plan B? Well, there is no, we have plans B, C, D, E, and F, um, which is what we've had, you know, so each change in the UK, we've actually had plans and have implemented them because we, you know, we predict them. Um, so, you know, getting to 13 requires, um, uh, and I want to make clear, make sure everyone understands this, the exchange rate compared to the last time is horrible. The dollar has grown in strength with everything we operate in dollars. So the 37% increase from the, the European Commission, 37%, basically makes up for the change in the exchange rate. So what we're going to do is take a five-year retrospective average of the exchange rates, um, because plus spot rates are useless and people aren't spending the money that day. Um, so when we get allocations to countries, we'll explain you know, the impact of the exchange rate. But the overall allocation will be less than the 13 if we get to 13 because of the exchange rate. I just want to make sure everyone understands that. The positive of that is in the countries, and this will explain in each of the letters, any local expenditures you actually gain a lot in because your, the local currencies have also gone down compared to all of our major currencies. So it's really only the international expenditures that are impacted. So it basically washes itself out. Not quite, but it's a, it, it balances itself. I just want to make sure everyone understands that so you're not shocked when we get to whatever number and then we allocate less because we can't allocate more than we have by the spot rate exchange rate. Gavi's in a better position because they do, if we were in the old model, it'd be easier, but because we actually have to allocate, it's more complicated. Um, we continue to raise money during replenishment cycles. It doesn't end the day of the replenishment. So in this past cycle, we raised $600 million more during the replenishment cycle than we had on the day of the replenishment. So our job doesn't end on September 16th. And um, that's the starting point for driving for increases over the period, three-year period. Um, and some countries have that flexibility. So we will, you know, we'll start where we are on September 16th, and then we'll all work together on what we do to increase contributions over the period of time so that we can get higher and higher. The problem the last time, we should have had $600 million for unfunded quality demand, but because of the exchange rate, it evaporated. So literally $600 million was lost because of the exchange rate fluctuations. We're getting better at hedging, we're saving a lot of money, we're looking at how we manage that better. Um, but that's why you didn't see it, because it was all lost to the exchange rate. Again, the countries did okay, because you, on a local basis, your exchange rate was so much better for your local expenditures. But that's, this is the complexities of the world we're living in. The only good news in that is the dollar should not get much stronger relative to other currencies over the next three to five years. But I hazard to say that because who knows? But it's hard to see it getting stronger. So hopefully we'll just see improvement and continue to raise money over time. So thanks, Mark. Um, actually, I think I wondered whether the reflection from the audience because I'm, I'm not so sure we did a great job as civil society in the last replenishment really. Um, dealing with replenishment as an ongoing process. I think we should actually say to each other, we need replenishment every year, every year, every year. The pledging session is just by coincidence happening every three years. And uh, you know, change gears and, and have a different approach um, and a bis di different mi business model maybe that we need to think about. Um, I have Mandy first. Yeah, sorry, Hannah from the Action Partnership. I, I think in our donor engagement center, um, that's certainly true that we're planning, like, what are we going to be doing in October and onwards. But I'm actually curious from a broader resource mobilization picture, is there more that Global Fund can be doing to really count and celebrate domestic resources when they increase? Um, without obviously lessening the pressure on donors and, and really highlighting how donor money can do things that specific government money sometimes can't. Um, but, but is there 
and more you can be doing to talk about resource mobilization as one big global effort and stress that partnership model. Well, thank you so much Mark, for the um, remarks that you have made. I wanted to ask, firstly, um, commitments that were made last year, have they been uh, met uh, on replenishment? But secondly, is uh, we've seen that African governments you know, are talking about domestic resource mobilization. Does that mean the government is not going to expect contributions from African governments? Thank you. Sorry, Daniel. I think we promised only to take that much time as, as Mark has, so final, final, final. So, great questions and related questions. So, Hannah, we actually do. Uh, it's a huge part of what we do, and we saw more than, my goodness, it's five or six. I had too many number, numbers in my head. Five billion dollars in increased commitments from governments because of the way we structured uh, the financing. And we plan to do more of that. We're actually, we're building into the catalytic fund into the allocations into some things around malaria which are in higher income countries to drive increased contributions and we use that enormous, that was a hugely important number in our raising of funds from the international partners because they're really watching them, you know how is domestic finance coming so we do um, making sure it comes in is something we're working on now you know um, and we're in our new approach, we had two spigots for increased domestic contribution. It was such a mess. I mean, it was confusing to everyone. Uh, it was confusing to us. It was confusing to the country. So we now have one domestic finance approach. Uh, and the language we used was pretty disrespectful to countries, actually. So now we just have co-financing and um, hydraulics related to co-financing. So we need to do more work on it, but we learned some great lessons from it the first time, and that's how we look at it. And you know, just as a concrete example, when President Obama hosted replenishment, we had chairs, including chairs from Africa and from the countries affected, and the private sector, and so it was actually the whole picture, and that's what we're really trying to get at. We've also, for those of you who have been with us in countries, changed the messaging. I mean, I, refuse, I still have to cross out Global Fund and Partners, or Global Fund has done X, Y, or Z. We're trying to stop that. It's not a secretariat. We are a partnership. There's no such thing as Global Fund and Partners. The Partners are the Global Fund. Um, and so we're really trying to get across that message that we are the Global Fund. You are the Global Fund. It's not a bunch of people sitting in Geneva. You're the Global Fund. And that's every sector that's engaged. So to all of your point, we did last time, and we do anticipate still getting contributions from African countries. We were just talking with the Minister of Health in Canada about it. So last time, South Africa, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Kenya, Nigeria, Namibia, all get contributions. I, I don't Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, yeah. Uh, so there are six, and I might be missing another. So we're anticipating, you know, continuing that trend, and it's hugely important. It's a little bit like the domestic finance to see countries contributing, and you know, some people are cynical and say, well, if you're giving them. 500 million dollars and they're giving you two, what difference does it make? It makes a huge difference because it's a symbol of the commitment of the country to engage. India gave, uh, Thailand, um, uh, so China. So this is a struggle we have when people say go find new donors. There's, there are very few countries that don't give to us. There are, almost everyone does. What we're trying to do is increase their contributions. And that's unique about us. I mean, we have implementing countries or recently implementing countries contributing, we just need the numbers higher. But we should be realistic. I mean, they, they are not going to go to hundreds of millions per country in the near term. We're trying to build a long-term support for that so that they engage more and more and more and over time they're fully owned. They're, they feel ownership too. So Kate and Rolf will stay to answer other questions. I just want to end, and I'm sure Peter will wrap up, but we deeply, deeply appreciate your engagement. Hey, John. Um, speaking of the full partnership, private sector too, um, um, you all are, in your country, if you look 10 years out, you are the people that are going to change everything. And you're doing it now, but it's just gonna grow and grow and grow. We feel a responsibility to support you within our parameters, but also to begin engaging with you 
who is the partnership to carry forward for the future so that you have the support and engagement? And what are the structural pieces we need to be good putting in place to make that happen? Because you are how we're going to change. I would just leave, we're all frustrated. We all want to be in a different position. We all want to be further along. But think about Durban 16 years ago. Think about what a meeting like this would have looked like. Think about what meetings did look like when I was going to countries at PEPFAR trying to get the LGBTI community together, trying to get the sex work community together, trying to get people dedicated to girls. I mean, you would be in a room with one or two people. Now I go 50, 60, 70, 100, 150 national civil society groups that have local chapters and are drilling down to the communities. I mean, it's a different world because of your work. So we should all be frustrated. We should all be pushing harder and harder and more and more. But take time to look at the difference between where we were at the last Durban conference, where you were, and where we are today. And we will take that and multiply it over the next three years. We don't have to wait 16. We can build and build and build in an exponential growth and an exponential approach, not a linear approach. So thank you for all you do in your countries, globally, you make all the difference in the world. So, Kate and Rob will stay. Thank you very much, it's been great to be with you. It's always my favorite part of these meetings, being with the real people, not the general talk fest. Um, so thank you. Amen, that's my wrap up. Uh, take a deep breath and then we continue for the next 16 years. Mark will leave us, um, as Mark said, Kate and Ralph are here.